this morning, whether you are with us live in the sanctuary or whether you are worshiping with us online, welcome. Let's go ahead, stand up on our feet, and let's get ready to sing. We make our beginning this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
This week, many of us will gather together in various arrangements, and we will give thanks. And part of that giving thanks is being reminded that when we are weak, when we are tired, when we are empty, Jesus fills us abundantly with his love, and may we always rest in the love that Jesus gives us every day. Amen? Amen. Please be seated. Well, you know, a few weeks ago, uh, Amazon sent us a catalog in the mail, and wouldn't you know that it's a catalog filled with all these toys for kids? And so we thought we'd get ahead of the Christmas season, and we said, uh, hey, Abigail, come here for a moment. Grab a marker, grab a pen, and uh, I want you to go through this catalog and circle all the toys that you're interested in, and this will kind of give us an idea as to what you want for Christmas. She was like, okay, so she grabbed a pen, she grabbed this catalog, she went over to the table, she spent about 20 minutes just going through it, and then finally she came back to us, she said, mommy, daddy, I'm done, here's what I want for Christmas. We said, okay, great, we'll we'll take a look, and so we we opened up to the first page, and then we opened up to the second page, and, and the third page, and then we started to thumb through it, and we quickly began to realize that she had circled like 90% of the toys in the catalog. Like if there were 10 on a page, she circled nine of them. Now, at first we thought, well, 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 maybe she thought that if she circles it, then she'll get it, and so she's just going to circle as many toys as she possibly can, but, but no, that wasn't it. Instead, when we sat down with her and we said, hey, why do you like these specific toys that you circled? She had some really great reasons as for why she wanted them. In other words, you could tell that she was passionate, she was interested, she was excited about the various toys that she had circled. And, you know, it reminds me, I love having two young kids because they know what they want, right? I mean, man, whenever I ask them what they want to do or what they want to eat or what they want to play with, I don't have to to draw it out of them. They tell me right away, and they do so with conviction. For example, we'll say, Abigail, where do you want to pick up food tonight? And immediately she'll say, oh, Evo's or Chick-fil-A, and then she'll like tell us exactly what she wants from those places, or we'll say, Abigail, it's Friday night, it's, it's movie night, which, 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 which movie do you want to watch? And her eyes will light up and she'll say, oh, I want to watch Mickey Mouse Christmas. Or Mommy, Daddy, I want to watch Cinderella. And we're like, Cinderella again? And she's like, yes, I want to watch it again. Or we'll say, Abigail, do you want to play a, a game tonight? And she'll, she'll say, yes, yes, let's play Dots and Boxes. Or Mommy, let's play Memory Game. And, and she'll run around the house trying to find all the things to, to play this game because you can tell she's so excited that we're going to be doing this. Or sometimes on the weekend, we'll have a free moment, and we'll say, hey, Abigail, is there anywhere that you want to go today? And she basically falls over. She's like, oh, can we please go to Coffee Pot Park? Or, oh, no, I want to go to Five Below. And she gets so excited, you can tell she's, she's ready to go to these places that she really, really wants to see. And you know, it's not just Abigail. Our, our, our one-year-old Haley, man, she also knows what she wants. For example, at the end of dinner, sometimes she'll still be hungry, and she'll go more, 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 and then she'll point at one of the kitchen cabinets because she knows that on the other side of those cabinet doors are food that she wants, and she's going to keep pointing and saying more, more, more until we open up those cabinet doors and bring out the food that she really, really wants to eat. And then at nighttime, of course, we, we get together, and, 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 and Haley, she goes right over to the books, and she picks out her two favorite books, and she brings them back to us, and she has them read it, and she points, and she smiles as we're reading these books to her. And then when we get to the end, she says, more, more, more. She wants us to read it again. And so we read it again and again, and it's like, how many times can you read Goodnight Moon to her? But it doesn't matter, because she is passionate and excited about the things that we are reading to her. You see, what I love about having two young kids is that they they know what they want and they express those wants with passion and excitement and conviction. But friends, let me ask you this. Have you ever noticed that that, that as we get older, that passion and excitement and conviction, it, it tends to go away? For example, when the Christmas season comes around, it's just like you, you don't feel the excitement and the joy that you felt when, when you were a kid. Or when a family member asks you what you want for Christmas, you don't hand them a catalog with all these things circled. No, what do you do? You say, uh, I don't know, I guess, uh, 
I guess I could use a gift card, right? Or how about those times that you're driving home after work and, and man, you, you don't have time to cook, so you're looking at all these fast food restaurants, but nothing really catches your eye. And now you're two blocks away, and now you're forced to pull into McDonald's, not because you want to eat at McDonald's, but because you got to eat. Or how about those times when you're sitting on the couch, and you're flipping through the channels, or you're scrolling through Netflix or Hulu, and, and you've gotten through like 40 or 50 different channels, 40, 50 different movies and TV shows, and nothing really interests you. And so what ends up happening, you end up watching a rerun of a show that you watched decades ago, like Seinfeld or, or The Golden Girls. Or how about those times when you get together as a family, especially around the holidays, and the younger kids, they want to play a game with you. Hey, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, you want to play this game with us? And you say, no, sweetie, that's okay. I'll, I'll just watch. Or how about those times late at night where it's like, man, I, I need to eat something before I go to bed, and you go to the kitchen cabinets, and you open up the doors, and there's all this food before you, but you spend like five minutes trying to figure out something that might interest you. And it's like finally you go for the granola bar, not because you actually like the granola bar, but because that's going to help deal with the hunger. Or friends, how about those times late at night when you get ready for bed and you look at your bookshelf of all the books that you have and you study the titles and nothing really stands out. And so you, f you finally just pull out a book and you lay in bed and you get to the second page and you've already closed it because you're just not that into it or you've read it before. You see, friends, as, as we grow older, that, that, that passion and excitement and conviction that we had as kids, sometimes it tends to be replaced with passivity and indifference and apathy. You know, the word apathy is derived from the Greek word apatheia. Apatheia has two parts. The first part is a, meaning without, and pathos, meaning emotion or feeling. In other words, to be apathetic is to be without feeling or emotion. In other words, there's no, no passion, there's no excitement, there's no conviction. Somebody could place something before you, and you wouldn't really have an opinion either way. You could go this way, or you could go that way. It doesn't really matter. You're apathetic. You see, this morning, we are finishing up our message series on the seven churches of Revelation, and each week, remember, Jesus has been looking at these churches, and he sees a, a specific issue or a specific problem that he wants to address with them. And as we come to the last church today, the church of Laodicea, we're going to see that Jesus is hyper-focused on a particular issue, issue, which is this, that the church in Laodicea had become rife with apathy. And in fact, here's the question that we're going to be looking at today. This is going to be our guiding question. How does Jesus view apathy? In other words, how does he view apathy in regard to the church in Laodicea? And how does he view apathy in regard to you and me today? And friends, as we go through our passage, what we're going to see is some pretty great irony that Jesus has strong convictions about people who live lives of apathy. Now, just a little background here. Take a look at this map. You'll see that, that, that Laodicea, of the seven cities, it was an inland city and it was the southernmost city of the seven cities. And at the time that John wrote the book of Revelation... Laodicea was perhaps the wealthiest city of all the cities. I mean, they had it made in the shade. Remember last week, Pastor Paul talked about in the, the city of Philadelphia, they experienced an earthquake and their buildings crumbled and the Roman government came in and said, hey, we can help you rebuild. And the city of Philadelphia was like, great, have at it. We're, we're so happy to have your help. Well, guess what? The city of Laodicea, they also experienced an earthquake and their buildings came crumbling down. And the Roman government showed up and said, hey, we can help rebuild your city. You know what Laodicea said? No, <laughs> we're good. <laughs> We've got enough money. We got everything. We're, we're good. We don't need your help. That's how wealthy Laodicea was. When you can turn away the Roman government, you've got it made in the shade. Now, here's what I find most interesting. When historians look back at these seven different cities, each of them had something notable about them. In other words, there was something that stood out. For example, we looked at the, the church in Smyrna. Remember, they were the first city in the whole Roman Empire that got to build the, the first temple dedicated to Caesar. And a few weeks ago, we looked at Sardis. Remember, Sardis was, was known as the birthplace of our modern currency system. 
Okay, each of these cities, they had something that, that was really stood out about them. But here's the thing. As historians look back at these seven cities, there's one city that, that didn't have anything notable about them. And that was Laodicea. They didn't have any achievements. They didn't have anything that they were known for. You could say that they were just a city that was just, that was just there. And you know what? This, this characteristic of the city of Laodicea, as we're going to see in, in, in our letter today... Jesus is going to show that this was also the characteristic of the church in Laodicea. Okay, take a look at how he begins his letter. Revelation chapter 3, beginning at verse 14. Jesus says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. Now friends, just like we've seen in all the previous letters, Jesus starts out his letter By demonstrating his authority, he's saying, hey, you need to listen up to what I'm about to tell you because I am, and then he describes who he is. Now, in this letter, he describes himself with the word amen. Now, when you and I say amen, we are usually responding to something that somebody is saying, and what we're saying is essentially let it be so or let it be true. In other words, we are agreeing with that person when we say amen. For example, If I say Jesus loves you, you would say, amen, right? Or if I said that you are saved, not by your works, but by God's grace in Jesus Christ, you would say, right? Or if I said that the greatest thing that you will ever taste on this earth is a red lobster cheddar biscuit, you would say, amen, right? Amen is our way of saying, let it be so, let it be true. Now, notice in that verse that Jesus describes himself as the amen, In other words, he's saying, hey, I am the one that lets it be so. I am the one who says that it is true. I'm the ruler over all creation. I'm the amen. And I need you to listen up to what I'm about to tell you. And friends, it's going to get ugly before it gets better. Take a look at verse 15. He says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. Now, friends, this this reference to hot and cold is kind of lost on us today. But back then, if you're the church in Laodicea, you know exactly what Jesus is talking about. Take a look at this map here. You can see Laodicea in the middle there. Right above it to the north was a city called Hierapolis. And to the southeast was a city called Colossae, where we get the book of Colossians. Now, check this out. Hierapolis was known for its hot springs. Colossae is known for its cold springs. Guess what the water supply is like in Laodicea? It's lukewarm. It's room temperature. And so, friends, if you're the church in Laodicea, Jesus starts out his letter like this. You can imagine that you're thinking, oh, Jesus is talking about our water supply, which he is making a reference to that. But as we're about to see, he's actually talking about their spiritual condition. Take a look at what he says next. He says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. Friends, this is the part in the letter where Jesus starts to lay out this idea that the church in Laodicea was a church rife with apathy. He's saying, hey, you guys aren't passionate. You guys aren't excited. You don't have convictions. I wish you did. I wish you were hot. I wish you were cold, but you're not. You're indifferent. You're passive. You're, you're apathetic. You're lukewarm. You're room temperature. Remember earlier we said that our guiding question is, how does Jesus view apathy? Take a look at how he describes and articulates his view of apathy in verse 16. He says, so, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Now, friends, that is an image. You know, when you get married, uh, there are a lot of wedding traditions that are associated with with getting married. For example, I remember the the day I got married, somebody's like, oh, we got to find something blue and something old and new. And I was like, what are you all talking about? Frankly, a lot of the wedding traditions I find strange. The strangest one, though, I think, is when somebody says, hey, let's take a piece of our wedding cake and let's freeze it for a year. And then on our one-year anniversary, let's take it out and let's eat it. Anybody ever done this before? Some of you are ashamed to admit it. It's all right. You know, we got married. My wife said, hey, we should do that. We should freeze a piece of our wedding cake. And I said, well, Lane, you can do that, but I'm not a leftover person. So if that's something you want to do, by all means, you can put it in the freezer. So she did. Roughly a year later, she pulled it out of the freezer. 
And she was excited, man. She opened up the tinfoil, she grabbed a fork, she dug in, she put it in her mouth, and immediately she ran over to the sink and spit it out of her mouth. And she was like, oh, that was the nastiest thing I've ever tasted. And I was sitting over on the couch like, I told you so. (laughs) Now, friends, here's the thing. A A year beforehand, that cake was delicious, right? That was some really good cake, but... But as it sat in the freezer for over a year, something about the contents changed to the point that when Elaine pulled it out, it was no longer pleasing to her. Rather, she was repulsed by it. Now, friends, in verse 16, how does Jesus view apathy? He's repulsed by it. The church in Laodicea had no passion. They had no excitement. They had no conviction. They were apathetic to the mission that Jesus had called them to be in the world, to love people, to feed people, to clothe people, to share their faith, and ultimately to be faithful to God, they didn't really seem to be interested in any of that. And so guess what Jesus is ready to do? He was ready to spit them out of his mouth. Now, those are some fighting words, I think, yeah? Take a look at what Laodicea has to say back to Jesus. Verse 17, you say, this is Jesus saying, you all are saying this to me, you say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. Friends, what is the church saying? Hey, Jesus, no offense, but we have everything we need. We're good. We've got this. We don't need your help. Remember, this was the exact same thing that they said to the Roman government when they tried to rebuild after the earthquake. We don't need your help. We got this. We're good. And friends, verse 17, those words are very revealing to us as humans because they show us why we become apathetic about so many things over time. And it's this. Take a look. That self-sufficiency breeds apathy. Self-sufficiency breeds apathy. In other words, the reason why we're indifferent and passive and, and all these different things is because we think that we have everything that we need. We don't need God's help. We've got it. We're good. Think about it like this. If Abigail wants to order a toy for Christmas from this catalog, she, she can't just order it, can she? I mean, I, I guess she could break into my phone and figure out how to do it, but, but right, right, she has to depend on me and Elaine in order to be able to, to get that toy. Now contrast that with you and me as adults. I could stop the sermon right now and I could pull out my phone and I could scan this little thing and I could, I could order one of these toys and by 7 p.m. tonight, it could be at my doorstep. Whatever I want, as long as I have the resources, I can get it. And the best part is I don't have to depend on anybody to get what I want. And friends, this is why at Christmas time when our family asks us what we want for Christmas, we don't really know what to tell them. Because we have everything that we need. And so all of a sudden, we find ourselves in a place of apathy, and what do we do? We say, well, I guess, I guess you could get me a gift card. You see, friends, here in our passage this morning, Jesus is, is reaching out to the church in Laodicea, and he's saying, hey, guys, I can help you. I can provide you with the things that you need. And they're saying, no, Jesus, we're good. We, we got it. We got everything we need. I mean, I guess... I guess if you had to get us something, Jesus, you could get us a gift card. Now, friends, that's what the church in Laodicea said. Watch what Jesus says in response to them. He says, you say you're good, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see, those whom I love I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Whoa. Friends, what is Jesus saying? He's saying, hey guys, you, you, you think you're good. You think you have everything you need. You think that all you need is a gift card, but you know what, here's the reality. I've got a whole catalog of things that you need. In fact, let me circle them for you. You need spiritual wealth. 
You need spiritual riches. You need to be clothed in righteousness. You need vision, vision of what it means to be a church, vision of what it means to be a Christian. And guess what? I'm just scratching the surface. I've got a whole catalog of things that you need, and I can give them to you. But don't you see, you you are so apathetic, you're so self-sufficient that you can't see what I see. You can't see that you become a church that is wretched and pitiful and poor and blind and naked. But you know what, at the very same time, you're still my church, which is why I'm rebuking you. It's why I'm disciplining you. I'm doing this because I love you. And I don't want to have to see you live the rest of your existence steeped in apathy and indifference and passivity. So church, be earnest and repent. Now friends, I want you to imagine for a moment that you're a member of this church And the pastor has received this letter from the Apostle John, and he's reading it aloud, and he gets to this point in the letter. And these words hit you kind of hard. All of a sudden, you're beginning to see that perhaps for almost all of your life, you've come to depend on yourself for everything that you've needed. In fact, you can't even remember the last time that you reached out to God for anything. Yeah, there was that one time a couple years ago where you had a health scare, and so you prayed to God then. Or there was that one time you needed a favorable outcome that was outside of your control, so you prayed to God then. But but by and large, you've come to depend on yourself for everything in your life. And it's not just you, it's everybody in this church. And so you sit there as as a member of the church of Laodicea, and you begin to realize, hold on a second. Maybe I have been so blinded by my apathy and indifference and passivity that I haven't been able to see that I don't really have what I need. Now here's the daunting part. If you're a member of this church, you gotta be thinking, okay, well, there are things that I need and Jesus can provide me with those things, but how do I get those things? In other words, how do I get to Jesus so that he can give me those things? Jesus knows what's coming. Take a look at what he says in verse 20. What are those first three words? Here I am. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens up the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Now, friends, let me ask you this. If I order a toy from this catalog for Abigail for Christmas, do I have to go all the way to the Amazon warehouse in Riverview to get it? No. What's going to happen? By 7 p.m. tonight, they're going to deliver it to me. And they're going to put it on my doorstep. And then what are they going to do? They're going to knock on my door. You see, friends, what Jesus is pointing out here is that he has the things that they need. And the good news is that they don't need to come to him. He's going to come to them. And in fact, he's already there. And he's knocking at their door. Friends, isn't this the heart of our gospel message? That we have a God that that we didn't have to go to, he came to us? You know, this next month, we're going to be celebrating the the season of Advent. That's what that's all about. We're we're going to be taking this time when we think about the waiting of the, the sin and the pain and the suffering. In the midst of all of that, the message of Christmas is that God came to us. And when he came to us, he brought us his forgiveness And he brought us his salvation, and he brought us his grace and his love. And best of all, he brought us himself, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. And friends, not only did he come to us, but he did everything for us. We didn't live a perfect life. Jesus lived a perfect life. We didn't die on a cross, Jesus died on a cross. We didn't rise from the dead, Jesus rose from the dead. We didn't reconcile ourselves to God, Jesus reconciled ourselves to God. And friends, this is the message that that Jesus was trying to get across to the, the, the church in Laodicea. They said, we're good, Jesus, we don't need anything. 
And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. I have what you need, and I'm standing at the door, and I'm knocking. Now, friends, I realize we're going long, but hang with me here because this next part is absolutely key. Okay, take a look at this again at verse 20. It says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Now, friends, let me ask you this. When Amazon delivers a package and they put it on your doorstep and they knock on your door, then what do they do? They get back in their car and they drive off. But, friends, in verse 20, what does Jesus do? He doesn't knock and run. No, he comes in and he eats with you and you with him. In other words, there's fellowship, there's communion, there's there's relationship. Remember earlier we said that self-sufficiency breeds apathy? What does Jesus show us on the other hand in verse 20? He shows us that dependency breeds relationship. You know, our two young daughters, they depend on us for a whole lot of things. They depend on us for food and clothing and shelter and safety every day. They are learning what it means to depend on their parents. But you know what? At the very same time, something really cool is happening. A relationship is developing. They're talking with us. And they're doing things with us. And they're laughing with us. And they're crying with us. And they're living life with us. And friends, this is why in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Jesus isn't knocking on the door with indifference. He's not knocking on the door with passivity. He's not knocking on the door with apathy. No, Jesus is knocking on the door with passion and excitement and conviction because he knows that when you and I depend on him for the things that we need, at the very same time, something special is happening. A relationship is developing. We're talking with him. And we're doing things with him, and we're laughing with him, and we're crying with him. We're living life with him. Friends, we believe that to be a follower of Jesus is to be in relationship with Jesus. And you know what? This relationship is not just something that lasts while we're here on this earth. This is a relationship that's going to last for an eternity. Which is why Jesus ends his letter with this particular promise. Take a look. He says, To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Friends, can you imagine that one day Jesus is going to grant us the right to sit on his throne? Can you imagine what that will be like? But you know what? Here's the thing. Jesus doesn't just let anybody sit on his throne. He lets people sit on his throne who he has a relationship with. And so you know what? In light of this letter this morning, here's here's the, the, the application. You know, sometimes in life, I think you and I, we can become self sufficient. We can depend on ourselves for everything that we need. And so when it comes time to pray, we have no problem praying for other people and the things that they need. But sometimes when it comes to ourselves, especially in certain seasons of life, it's like we kind of say, hey, Jesus, we're good. We got this. We, We don't need anything. We're fine. But friends, here's the challenge this morning. I want to encourage all of us to stop asking Jesus for the gift card And start asking him for the things that we really need that he can provide. Because the reality is that he is knocking at our door and he's saying, hey, what is it that you need? And friends, as followers of Jesus, part of living a life not of apathy but of conviction is being able to say, hey, Jesus, this is what I need. For example, Jesus, I need your patience I've got a family member who is just driving me up a wall, and man, my witness to them right now is really severely damaged, and I just need your patience. Lord, please give me the ability to work with this person. 
Or Jesus, I need your wisdom. I got a couple opportunities before me. I got paths that I can take, and I don't know which one to take. Lord, show me the way that you would want me to go. Or Jesus, I need your forgiveness. There is something that I've been doing that is not good. And Jesus, not only do I need your forgiveness, I need the courage to be able to tell the people in my life the things that I've been doing that are hurting them. Or Jesus, I I need your peace. My spouse and I, we are constantly butting heads. I'm angry, I'm upset, I don't know what to do. Jesus, please bring peace to our relationship. You see, friends, as we've seen in this letter this morning, Jesus is repulsed by apathy. And because he is repulsed by apathy, he doesn't want us as his children to simply ask for the gift card. He said he wants us to ask him what it is that we need. And so that's my encouragement for you today, that whenever you pray, ask Jesus for what you really need. And know that as you ask those things, at the very same time, it is cultivating and helping to build your greatest need, which is a relationship with the one who stands at the door and who knocks and who comes in and who eats with you and you with him. Friends, my prayer for each and every one of us here today is that as we continue to call out to Jesus for the things that we need, that we learn to depend on him at the same time. May we experience that wonderful fellowship, that wonderful communion, that wonderful relationship that he gives to us when he comes to us and he gives us what we need. Let that be our prayer today, amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, sometimes in life we find ourselves in seasons where we become passive just like the church in Laodicea. And the reason we do this is, well, because we're pretty self-sufficient. Especially here in the United States, if we want something, as long as we have the resources, we can get it. And Lord, that that self-sufficiency over time, it, it breeds this apathy that sometimes we can't even see. We look at kids running around, enjoying and having fun and doing these things and having these strong convictions, and we think, man, what happened? How come I don't feel what they feel? How come I don't do what they do? What, what is wrong with me? And Lord, today we come to understand through the church in Laodicea that that the apathy just just breeds this this mess all over our lives. And Lord, we know that that apathy is is, kind of repulsive to you. You are ready to spit the church out of your mouth. But yet you didn't. You rebuked them and you disciplined them because you wanted them to be able to to live a life of passion and excitement and conviction by being in relationship with you and depending on what they need as a church and as individuals. And so, Lord, that's our prayer today. We pray that the things that that you called out the church in Laodicea to do as a church, as people, we pray that we would continue to work on those things knowing that we can't do it on our own, but rather we do that when the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us as a church and as families, and as individuals. Lord, we give thanks that as we prepare for this this season of Christmas coming up, that you came to us and you gave us everything that we need. You gave us your grace and forgiveness and salvation. And so we want to lift up to you today by praying the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, we are reminded today that Jesus is standing at the door and he's knocking and he desires fellowship with us when we learn to depend on him. And you know, we have been given so many blessings in our lives. He gives us salvation and grace and love and all these different things. And, and part of our worship is giving back a portion of the things that he's given to us. And so this morning, if you're here in the church, we have a basket that you can drop an offering on the way out this morning. Also, if you're worshiping with us online, you can give at oursaviorfl.org. 
You can text to give. We are also on Venmo at Our Savior FL. Let's go ahead and stand this morning as we continue our worship together. Good and your mercy endure it forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endure it forever. People, people from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you. Good and your mercy endure it forever. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you for who you are. We worship you. Oh, 
good.